the people, you are welcome to our session today, SCRD 107, Vulnerable Populations and Special Needs. Um, this week, we have the honor of uh, hosting the Downs Syndrome Society of Kenya. They will be educating us on this condition of Down syndrome. Um, I will invite Rosalyn. Rosalyn, if you're on the call, please. Would you care to introduce your team? Um, uh, my name is Eric. I'll speak on behalf. My name is Eric. I can can you hear me? Yes, Eric. You're welcome. Asante sana. My That's name is good. Eric. I'm, I'm, I'm the chair of Down Syndrome Society of Kenya. Uh -huh. I will introduce Rosalyn in her absence. I think she was she's stuck in a bit of traffic, but I think we could proceed uh, once you're ready. My name is Eric Madet, the chairman of Down Syndrome Society of Kenya. Thank you very much, Eric, for being with us at this point in time. Uh, Eric, with you are Catholic nuns who are running special needs homes, small homes, uh, offices, and all that var variety of service and ministry uh, to children that could be vulnerable, that children that could be of special needs. We are learning a certificate course in social work as a way of honing our skills in ministering to people in vulnerable situations. So we have listened before to the Autism Society, and we would like also to listen to the Downs Syndrome Society of Kenya so that we get educated on this condition. Our sisters usually receive children in this condition that are usually brought to them by parents or relatives who might be incapable or struggling with how to manage uh, this condition. So in a sense, our sisters step in the shoes of parents at certain points in time uh, for these children. It would be good that we learn from DSSK as much as we can on how to receive, diagnose, and probably uh, handle these situations. So you're welcome, Eric, take the floor and feel free to moderate your colleagues as you please. We have two and a half hours on us. You could have input for an hour and we spend another hour on question and answer. Welcome, Eric. Thank you very much. Uh... Richard, it's a pleasure. It's a great honor to have this opportunity to be able to address you and to be able to address this class. We are greatly honored because as a society, we look for opportunities to be able to be felt and to pass awareness to anybody who cares to listen to us. When you create a, create a forum like this, we are so grateful because we know that the message is being sent out on what people do not understand. I'll introduce myself. My name is Eric Madete. I'm the current chair of the Down Syndrome Society of Kenya. The society uh, was formed way back in 2014. That is when, uh, 2004, sorry, when we registered this society. This came out of a need for people to find support in their parenting for children with Down Syndrome. How did we come together? Um, I am a father of a child with Down syndrome, now an adult. He's called Bradley. Bradley is 21 years now. He's our firstborn son, firstborn child. And of course, when you expect a child and your firstborn child comes with a challenge, you get to wonder what <laughs> uh, is happening to you. Mm -hmm. So when we got the boy, he did, we did not understand what was happening, and therefore we began to seek for information. And that led us to a group that was formed at Gertrude's hospital then, 
It was just a support group by parents who had children with challenges similar to ours. And there we began to learn on how to take care of our child from the experiences others had had concerning the Down syndrome. Therefore, with time, we decided to come up with the Down Syndrome Society of Kenya, which was aimed at um, uh, educating people. It is supposed to inform and lobby and create awareness, cause enhancement amongst people who have children with Down syndrome. So the society was comprised of parents and guardians and siblings and friends who wanted to be members or to support any child or any person with Down syndrome. And therefore, the society boasts of uh, quite a number of people. We have had workshops, we have uh, uh, medical camps, we have uh, uh, get togethers just to support one another, to learn from each other. And this has gone on for the last several years. And we thank God that it, it has been very helpful to many parents. We have a WhatsApp group that uh, a lot of parents log in to just to find out what's happening. We have a website that we've come up with. And we're trying to send as much information out as we possibly can. So as a parent to a child with Down syndrome, and as a chairman of the Society of Kenya, I speak from a point of experience on what Down syndrome is. Basically, I know you probably have had an understanding of what Down syndrome is. Down syndrome is a chromosomal disorder that arises at the point of cell division. It's a genetic abnormality during the cell division in which Every human being has 23 chromosomes in a cell. And out of the 23, there are double units on each of those units. And therefore, you have 46 genetic materials on, 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 on in each cell. However, for people with Down syndrome, during chromosome, uh, during the cell division, the chromosome number 21 somehow develops a third member. So instead of two, you have three. So in total, a person with Down syndrome normally has 47 uh, members on the chromosome instead of the usual 46. Therefore, that creates an extra chromosome. Yeah, that's why it's called, uh, uh, that, that's why it's called chromosome uh, trisomy 21 because it happens on the 21st chromosome. Now, there are different types of, uh, um, different types of, uh, down syndrome, there's trisomy, there's mosaic, but all of them still center around the fact that there is an extra genetic material in the cells. So instead of 46, you have 47. It is also called trisomy 21 because this particular extra material, genetic material happens on chromosome 21. So you'll find Down syndrome sometimes referred to as trisomy 21. Now we celebrate down syndrome, World Down Syndrome Day, every third month, every 21st day of the third month to mark the 21st chromosome. I mean, the, the, the extra, extra genetic material on the 21st chromosome. So you have 21st of March every year, we mark the Down Syndrome Day. Uh, I hope we are together. Yes, we are following. Thank you. In case you get stuck, you you, you are ready. You you are free to interject. Mm, now, sounds quite sounds quite technical, uh, but uh, endeavor to break it down simpler. <laughs> I'm making it as simple as it can. If it was a medical yes. doctor, not a bit more than that. But but the basic thing is, uh, in Down syndrome, you have an extra genetic material that causes intellectual and learning disability, developmental disabilities, in a person who is born with Down syndrome. That also comes with certain characteristics or facial features that will distinctly show a person that has Down syndrome. How do you tell a person who has Down syndrome before even going to the medical bit of it? There are very simple things that you can easily notice on a person with Down syndrome. And sometimes you will always discover or think that these are all born by one parent or a, a set of parents, because they have similar features. They have slit eyes. They're slanting upwards on the outside. So many of us call it Chinese eyes. The eyes are slit, they are small. They're not as usual as anybody else. You'll find that their ears are set a little lower than our ears on the head. So you'll find they're slightly below the eyes. 
Another easy way to detect a person with Down syndrome is if you look at the palm of your hand, you will find in most cases, we have three lines running across your palm. But in most cases, you'll find people with Down syndrome have one line running across the palm. That's an easier way of telling, but it's not always that a person with one line is a Down syndrome, a person with Down syndrome. The other bit is they have short, stubby fingers. They have a big tongue. The tongue is a little thicker in the mouth. So then that impacts on the way they communicate as well. Those are some of the basic things you can tell when you're looking at a person who has Down syndrome. Their eyes, their ears, their tongue, and the general features of the body of the head almost mirror one to another. So if you see someone of that, the easier, the, the, first, the first thought is that they have Down syndrome. However, it is not that everybody that has those features is Down syndrome. Some may be born in that way. So don't look at anybody and assume that one is Down syndrome. Now, certain things have happened that over the years that have affected persons uh, with disability in, in this way. For instance, when we got our child, you remember in the old days, we used to call them mongoloids. And that has become a very offensive term to use. It would be easier for me to describe to the old generation, a person who is, um, has features of Down syndrome looks like a mongoloid because they would understand what it means. However, it is one of those words we should not be able to use in this current age and uh, time. It's better to refer to them as person we live in with Down syndrome. And you also, also don't say that Down syndrome people. It is a little offensive when one thinks that associates you with Down syndrome. These are children and people born. It's just that they have a disorder that does not predispose them to develop and grow as you would grow. The other thing that you need to realize is and a person with Down syndrome has uh, delayed milestones. They will have slow development in terms of uh, catching up with the milestones. And it is very important at this point that once one is diagnosed to have Down syndrome, it is important to begin to have early intervention. And that is where many of the developing countries have a problem with. First is to diagnose that this is a child with Down syndrome. Our experience as parents is that by the time some come to discover, it is after they have noticed several things have happened to their children and they have struggled with their children and, 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 and they get to know it as a shock. We were blessed to know our child's condition a few weeks or a few months after he was born. After we did struggle, however, one of the doctors, the pediatrician did not agree that he was Down syndrome. However, the cardiologist mentioned and took us through the counseling to tell us that this child will grow in this way and you need to intervene in this manner. Therefore, there are many parents who come to discover much later that their children are not growing well, they are slow in, in catching up the milestones and they don't discover that they have uh, Down syndrome. Part of the things that you need to know when you're dealing with a child with Down syndrome is that um, they have um, issues with the medical uh, conditions quite a bit. Part of it is that they have heart problem. A lot of them are born uh, and the heart does not close as it ought to. And therefore, about 50% of the people who are born with Down syndrome develop heart problems. The best to do at that point is to have a heart surgery to correct the situation. A number of cases will close, their hearts may close, but it is not guaranteed that it will. But in Down syndrome, because of the slow developmental growth, they will need assistance to have those holes closed. We have muscle hypotomia. That means the muscles have low tones. Children with Down syndrome they are born with muscles that are not strong enough. The intervention that you need at that point is physiotherapy as soon as they begin to uh, move. Let uh, every parent know that it is important to have physiotherapy for children who have um, Down syndrome. The other bit is they also need to do occupational therapy to be able to learn how to carry on the usual life activities. The, 
The other bit of it is we have a problem with hearing and the, basically the ENT system gets affected because of the slow growth. And therefore, it is important for an ENT specialist to have a look at a child who has Down syndrome. Otherwise, they may develop hearing problems, visual problems, and other adenoid. We also have adenoidal problems. Um, so you'll find them snoring quite a bit. It is important for one to intervene on their, on their behalf. It says that hearing may be affected up to 65% of the people with Down syndrome. Vision problem occurs in about 50% of people with Down syndrome. Eight to 2% have gastrointestinal problems. So the tract that you need to see a gastrointestinal entomologist to be able to have a look at the child and keep on checking them through and through. The other major common problem with people with Down syndrome is that they have um, thyroid problems. A lot of them have hypotomia thyroid dysfunctions and it can cause it can lead to a lot of problems with the heart and, and general growth um, of the child and then due to the advanced yes please you need to restate that word philo sorry eric you need yes, to restate please. that word you said philo what it's gastrointestinal gastrointestinal Okay. Yes, the systems mm. with yes. Yeah, so they, they need to have um, they, they need to get a, a doctor, a specialist in that bit. Please come again also on the the, the other name for snoring. Is it a a dom I I I'm not aware. The word is adenoids. When you have affected affected adenoids, adenoids. So some may need surgery for that purpose, to correct that system so that uh, you avoid things like, no, it's adenoids, A-D-E-N-O, adenoids. However, I must also mention that because of the improved Medicare situations in, in the world and basically all over now, we are having people living with Down syndrome living almost up to the age of 55. The expectancy, life expectancy now has gone up to about 50, 55 to 60 years. Before then, it was very difficult to go beyond the age of 24, 25, but now we are having people growing to that age and older. I hope we are together on this. Yes. Okay, good. Now let's go on to um, what we as a society are doing at the moment to help with these situations. As a society, we have engaged parents, we have engaged professionals, and we engage government in a number of things to be able to help us make life easier for people with Down syndrome. Because of the continual medical health care that they need, the challenges that parents face is access to medical care. It is so expensive. For instance, I'll give you our example. At the age of six months, our son had to go through a heart, an open heart surgery. For the first eight months of his life, he stayed most of it in hospital because he was in and out of hospital. Because of their vulner vulnerability, Contracting diseases was very easy, especially the throat, uh, the bacterial and viral infections were very common. So a lot of times we had to go to hospital in and out. And on average, I'll be very honest on average, sometimes you do two hospital visits a month at an early age because they would get infections almost any time they would come into contact with people, they would get it with other children, they would get an infection. So the first few months of, of his life, we kept on going in and out of hospital, a lot of times on, um, a lot of times on uh, antibiotics to cure the diseases. Um, we also had to see a ear specialist to be able to check him. Now, lately, at his age 21, uh, a couple of two months ago, he developed convulsions, which he had never had since growth. 
And we thought we were out of this until he came down with convulsions three times and we are, we are now seeking medical attention. He could come with me today because he's going to see the doctor concerning the scene. So we discovered that his heart rate is low, that his high, th high thyroids are not functioning well. He's, he's got hypothyroidism. So he's on medication for that. And those are the challenges you'll always get as the children grow. The other bit of challenges that you have quite a lot is acceptance into society. When a parent gets a child with Down syndrome, a lot of experiences we have at the moment is the men desert the women and sometimes vice versa. Because some believe that it is not part of their lineage, it must have come from the wife's side or the other side. And therefore there is a lot of argument on who has brought this. I want to make it very clear that Down syndrome is an accidental incidence and does not arise from any of the parents' deficiencies or sins, as people would say. It is not witchcraft. It is just a pure accident at the time of cell revision that it happens. Now, it does also mean that it is not positive. It's not given that if you have one child with Down syndrome, that the next child will also have Down syndrome. It is not given that it will happen that way. An accident is an accident. If it does happen again, it's just an unfortunate situation. But Down syndrome is not contagious. You cannot carry it on to another child. It is an accident that we need to accept happened and that, and, and that it, it, it may never. So there's a fear of getting another child with a similar condition amongst a lot of people who especially get their first children with Down syndrome. Uh, that is a myth that should be dispelled. The other bit is to say that uh, the older you get, the more likely that you are to get a person, a child with Down syndrome. It has not been scientifically proven. Scientists say that the older you get, the likelihood of getting a, dis a child with disorder is very high, but that doesn't mean that Down syndrome obviously comes with age. There are people who are 20, 23, 22, 21, who still get children with Down syndrome. So it has, nobody has to have fear about getting a child with Down syndrome because of age. So society has not accepted these children also in, and a lot of them are feeling ostracized from society by the mere fact that they are not accepted. Now, a parent who has a child with Down syndrome begins to first experience their own problems as a parent because of rejection by society. And then there are unexpected uh, challenges that come with a child with, with, the, with the disability. And therefore, part of the first instant that you need to begin to treat is the parents themselves. Whenever as professionals, I would advise you get a person who has a child with disability. The first person you need to begin to deal with is the parent or the guardian, because the challenges they are facing may impact on how they relate with you as a professional. Begin to think of them. What are they thinking? What are they feeling? And the moment they experience rejection, the way they have experienced rejection from other people, then you are not able to help them as much as you would. We felt rejected at some point when we went to a school. We have, we God blessed us with four children. We, have, we wanted to move all the children into one school. But the moment they discovered that we have one child with disability, they told us, you are not going to admit that one here. And we had to leave that school. Not because the child needed diapers, needed a, care, a caregiver, no. The child is able to handle themselves, but the fact is they just did not want to have an abnormal, in quotes, child in class. Therefore, rejection of people with Down syndrome begins right from the adults and not the children. So it is important that people, uh, society realizes that any person who has a child with disability, one, is a member of society and seeks acceptance. And then number two, a person living with disability seeks acceptance and love from society as well. So societal rejection is a big issue. Institutions in Kenya particularly are still not accepting children with Down syndrome into their school system. We, we continue to encourage people with, living with Down syndrome to be taken 
today in quotes, normal school, what we call the mainstream schooling system. Reason being, people with Down syndrome learn from seeing and learn from hearing. When you take such a person to a special needs class where there's little communication and little example, it becomes difficult to mold the character of that particular child. It is therefore important that mainstream systems begin to accept children with disability, especially developmental disability, because they learn from what they see and they learn from what they hear. And that is the same as in family setups. So we encourage schools to take them on and let them learn from them. The other bit is that um, the schooling system is such that they center more on what one can memorize get a hold of and memorize and has less to do with what work can do with their hands and talents. We thank God for the coming CBC system. We hope it will clear that, that people are also graded based on what they can do. A child with Down syndrome, depending on the severity, again, let me stress here that not all of them are the same. It depends on the severity of the case. Some are mild, some are severe. So it is important to note when your child is mild or when your child is severe and therefore the proper intervention methods are put in place. Therefore, systems should be put in place where they can also exploit their talents, learn to use their hands, learn to use their talents to, to do something. One of the things about children with Down syndrome is they're very happy people. They bring joy to any particular, in, in, um, any particular situation and environment. However, many have taken advantage of that and have done what is not right and misused them. For instance, when a girl living a Down syndrome reaches the age of maturity, they also want to be felt and accepted. And therefore, they are also part and part of society and they are happy to involve themselves with others. But we have people who take advantage of them which has been very unfortunate and it happens quite a lot. Now that takes me to the next point that where a situation where children are with disability are violated, for instance, their rights are violated, who addresses them? We are currently working on a judicial, with the judiciary to work on a judicial system where people with disability, particularly developmental disability, are given a chance to be heard and judgments are made based on their ability to communicate and ability to identify the things that need to identify in a court system. Our court system is such that anybody who is, of, who is a victim needs to give a testimony or witness against the person who is offended, who was offended. In most cases, the people with disability uh, with Down syndrome may not be able to coherently pass this information properly be able to identify the person who did the injustice to them and testify against them. And lots of time we've seen that, that people are let off the hook. And that's why you will hear sometimes people are let off the hook, even in murder cases, rape cases, uh, and, and yet they insist that the person with disability to give testimony. We have been able to uh, work through this and we are teaching the court users to accept testimonies from people with disability as and when they are able to give but also use other facts and other evidence to deal and nail such people. We therefore are um, working with the judiciary to be able to do that amongst the, the lawyers, the, 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 uh, any, any of the parties that use the court system to be able to have people with disability have their rights. People with disability of special Down syndrome are always disinherited. For instance, um, because of their inability to make decisions that pertain to investments and all that, a lot of them are left out in the wheels. They are not considered as part of the, 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 the people to inherit whatever is left behind. And if such a thing goes to court, you find a lot of it is also given to other people and, 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 and the people with Down syndrome are denied their rights to inherit. We are fighting that. And we are hoping that everybody will realize that a person with disability is a human being, albeit a little special than everybody else. 
and we need to be taken care of just like anybody else. I think um, part of the other thing that I would say is that we are also seeking to have government, government involved in issues to do with disability, especially, especially developmental disability. A lot of the disability issues, especially as professionals you will deal with, are physical disability because you encounter them quite a lot and they're able to express themselves, the deaf, the blind, the dumb. They will be able to express themselves and they will be able to move, they'll be able to represent themselves. People with developmental disabilities are not capable of, in a way, not able to adequately represent themselves. And this will need, they will need a lot of help in being able to represent themselves. This has not been easy for us to do. And therefore we consider, a lot of it is considered as uh, mental and considered and lumped up together with mental disorders, mental um, disorders that have no representation. We are asking that anybody who cares to listen needs to know that any child with Down syndrome or developmental disability has a right to be heard and can communicate, albeit a little, but they need people to help them to communicate. And that's why we, need, we have uh, minders with them. We are asking the government to be able to consider them as well in the tax rebates. They have not been considered in tax rebates at all. Only those who have physical disabilities have been considered in tax rebates. Guardians and parents of persons with Down syndrome need to be considered, but that, part, that also includes autism, dyslexia, ADH. All those should be part and parcel of the people considered as special that can be considered in tax rebates for, for, for their caregivers. I wish to know if there's anybody who would want to know something as we go on, because I'll also ask if Teresia, I think Teresia should be here, Teresia should be here with us, she'll also give us a bit on that part of uh, what we're going to say. I'll give a moment for somebody who would want to say something. Good morning, Sam. Good morning to you. Yes, thank you so much for your input. It is very touching. And maybe you can go back to the beginning, the way you explained how it comes, how those syndromes divide. I did not get properly that area. OK, Please. I will do that. Anybody else? Anybody else? OK, I will I'll, talk, I'll go back to how uh, Down syndrome occurs. I say this, the Down syndrome is a purely accidental and it is not genetic. Uh, so it is not passed on from one person to another. Is a chromosomal disorder which occurs during cell division, where the female and the male uh, parts meet. There is always um, a fusion of the male sperm and the female egg to form a fetus. At the point of, of, of division of the cells to begin to form the child, there could be an accident. And therefore, in that accident, they say, there's an error in cell division during conception that results in the presence of a third chromosome. There is a third chromosome on uh, genetic material number 21. We are all formed of cells. Each cell has got chromosomes, and we have 46 in each cell. However, a person with Down syndrome has 47 on the, on, in, on, in each cell, but the 21st uh, chromosome has an extra genetic material that makes it 47. So that is what results in Down syndrome. Now, the effects are it causes developmental and intellectual disorders. So they are slow in development and their minds do not develop at the same level. So you will find a person with Down syndrome has a number of years behind the other children or the other people. You'll find a person of 10 years behaving like a three or a four year old because their mind is not developed, intellectually developed to that level that they can match up with the, with the rest of them. However, the rest of the things are, they are as human as anybody else. They can behave, they can be taught, they will be taught, they will grow slowly in learning. And that's why when you come to class, when you come to school, it is important to notice when you have a child who is slow in school, what could be the issue? It, it may be Down syndrome, therefore their mental development is slower. You'll find a child who's gone up to class seven, but cannot 
be able to read. Because we, even if you kept them in the same class, they may not be able to read and read properly. So there's no point in keeping them in the same class through and through and through. Just let them go through the system because the best bit of being in school is they are socializing with others and learning from them. It is important to realize life is not about grasping educational materials. It's about exploiting the full time potential of the person. The person's potential could be something else. We have people with Down syndrome who are excellent in swimming, excellent in sports, excellent in, in, in other fields other than the intellectual field. And therefore, that's what we say, we need to, to identify their weaknesses, identify their conditions and put them in the right, or the right course for intervention um, for that purpose. I hope that, I, I don't know if that helps. Yes, it has. And then sometimes I, we normally hear stories in the society that when the lady uses specific um, contraceptives, they also associate with that, especially when they take these long pills, maybe for five years or more. Or is it really true or what can you say about it, please? We do not have any scientific evidence to prove that that causes Down syndrome that we, we don't have any, any research that unless somebody has come up with any recent research, as of now, we don't have any. It's purely an accident that happens. It can happen to a person of 20 years, 21, 16, or 35, or 40 uh, during conception. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else before we go to Teresia? Hello, my name. Yes. Yes. Um, you've also mentioned you you mentioned now that just about swimming and everything. I was asking myself, is this person able to participate in other co-curriculum activities? But you have already mentioned about the swimming, the the sports. They can do that. And I was saying, what about the body size? Is there any effect? and walking, do you see any deformity in the legs? That's my question. Yeah, okay. I'd, I'd, I'd say this, that um, a person with Down syndrome can participate in anything. As I said, they have special giftings and not necessarily the intellectual gifting. They can excel in other fields very well. Some have done very well in sports, some have done very well in acting. Some have done very well in, 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 in professional fields. For instance, and I keep on saying that in, in well-developed countries where intervention has taken place early in life, when, when you notice your child has Down syndrome, you begin to do the necessary intervention methods, do physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and then check on the heart and the ears. You begin to put that child on a course for proper development. And once you begin, they begin that they can they can begin to exploit what is in them. One, they are very good at repetitive actions. So you'll find they're very good if you employ them in your company, for instance, to do repetitive actions like packaging and all that. There are also in developed countries where people with Down syndrome, living with Down syndrome, have actually been employed into the field and are doing, for instance, restaurant service. If you Google properly, you'll find a number of places where um, adult Down syndrome, uh, people living with Down syndrome are able to live and act actively participate in society and even marry. The biggest weakness is where proper intervention has not been taken place and therefore it takes time for that person to grow into what they ought to be. But once early intervention is done, and this is why we as a society are also doing this amongst doctors, and medical staff that children need to, you need to begin to look at, at the child that is born in your care. What can you identify about that child even before the parent has? As a health caregiver, can you notice anything different about that child? Because once you get that point, intervention begins. As I said, for instance, ours, um, when he was born after four weeks, we were told he has a hole in the heart. 
So we had to confirm that again after one month. And then once that was confirmed, that within that one month, the hole did not close, he said, now he needs to go for uh, heart surgery. And that's where at six months, he had to go for heart surgery. Now, that is not enough. Every, almost every year, a child with living with Down syndrome needs to be taken for medical checkup because these things keep on progressing. Something new may come and it needs to be captured before it extends to become bigger. So in, that intervention will help you. Uh, once the, the child has developed proper muscle tone, has developed proper uh, living um, behavior, it is very easy for them to participate in many other activities. The, the, the other thing that I know normally is very difficult is for them to be accepted by the others into that activity. Again, that stigma needs to go because I raise my child like any other child in the house. You see, if you raise them special, even in the home, then you're already opening doors for them to become failures because they will always think they're special everywhere they go. If it is house chores, let them do the house chores as anybody else. If it's going to get water, let them get water. Do not treat them so special to the point that they cannot handle things for themselves. It is possible to train them to handle things for themselves. And part of the things you do in early childhood is learn, let them learn to do potty training. Let them learn to eat on their own. Let them learn to clean after they have eaten, to make their beds, to brush their teeth, to wash themselves. Those are basic skills that will carry them forward. So you, should, you do not have to keep on bathing your child until he's 25. Uh, brushing their teeth on their happy half. You only need to do it and they learn it from you. And those skills will help them do a lot more. My son now is doing a vocational training in, in restaurant service. And he does that in the house. He feels very excited when he has to do it for us. He does baking. He helps in the kitchen. And you know, that, that, that's what he loves doing. So whenever he's at home, he knows that setting up the table is his place. After that, he will undo, he'll clean the utensils. He's 21 and he knows his family responsibilities. So yes, they can do a lot more than just sitting there. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have also a question. Yes. Mm, in my experience, the little experience that I have, I've, uh, I've seen these children with the Down syndrome, both here in Kenya, and uh, outside uh, the continent. <clears throat> but uh, looking at them the way I have seen, it is through the, uh, they learn very slowly. Mm -hmm. Their mental development is too slow for some of them. Mm -hmm. But there is something else that I don't know whether it is my own perception or it is the correct thing that majority of them, they are so stubborn and they get irritated of a very small thing. Why is it like that? Good. Now you mentioned something about too slow and too slow. I don't know on which standards you're using and that's why I say. Um, to learn this. Yes, that's why I say like this. People with Down syndrome are not gifted intellectually. So when we insist on learning, especially educational material, that becomes a problem. We need to reorient ourselves to know that, and I say this, that life is not all about education. It is about exploiting the full talent, uh, the full potential of the person. When we insist on education, it becomes a problem. Now, the frustration that a person with Down syndrome has to express themselves to feel felt because he wants to communicate but doesn't know how to speak it. You speak to them as you command them to do something. They would want to tell you, no, I feel this way, but they're not able to express themselves. So naturally, there is always a force that comes against that insistence. And that is what happens. They come out as rude. They come out as difficult. They come out as... Um, very, very difficult people to deal with. Children with Down syndrome 
need to learn a lot more on character building and learning other than the disciplining issue. The discipline comes in as a last resort, but the best to be able to teach a child with Down syndrome is to, to set examples for them. You want this to be done, tell them to do it, tell them nicely, or do it so that they do it after you've done, you've done it and they see how you do it. The problem we normally have a lot of times is you want to order and they should say it. Just like a person with, um, what do you call it, kigugumizi, whenever they would want to communicate something and they, they are not able to utter those words in good time and you seem to be impatient, it becomes difficult to deal with. It's just the same with a person with Down syndrome. They're trying to express themselves, you don't understand them, and that you want them to do what, what you want, you want them to do what you want. So they also have, especially when they reach teenagehood, they also want to show that they are fully grown, that they are growing or they are fully grown and you not just push them. That's number one. Number two, I must also say that a, bit, a, a lot about discipline comes from the fact that parents do not learn to discipline their children. They think because they are special, everybody must treat them special. And I keep saying this, that any child from the moment they are born are capable of manipulating a parent. They will cry because that's the only way they can communicate. And you, depending on how you respond, they will know they have met, they have done, they have, they have, met, they have, they have made you move. So depending on how you respond to a child with Down syndrome, they will respect you or they will revolt. So do not think that a child with Down syndrome cannot be disciplined. But as I say, discipline comes through learning. And the parents have left this and thinking, we are not special. There's nothing we can do about him. And he will grow. And he knows he can, he, can, he can manipulate you. When he wants something, he cries. When he wants something, he will make noise or he will throw stuff. Just like any other child. If a person wants something, let them ask for that. Do not let them throw stools and bang doors to communicate. You will tell your other child not to do that. Tell the Down syndrome child not to do that. I hope we, we are together. Yes. Um, I would want to ask if Teresa could tackle a bit of what she had, then we can go on with, with the questions. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yes, please. Um, I'll, Teresa is, is, is is an advocate, an advocacy person in terms of disability and especially Down syndrome. Um, she will introduce herself further, and then she will tell us a bit on on the same topic we're dealing with. Then we will take more questions after that. After that, Carry on, Teresa. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to um, contribute on this forum. My name is Teresa Nderi, and uh, I'm an advocate for people living with Down syndrome. But then over time, you realize that the parent who has a child with Down syndrome also has a child with autism. And then now you have to cover a whole um, array of developmental disability. Uh, that said, I'm also the founder of an organization called Geuza Wazo Foundation. The name speaks for itself. We seek to change perspective of people uh, with regards to how they perceive developmental disabilities uh, and I, I really like placing more emphasis on Down syndrome because I had a sister who um, lived with Down syndrome and she lived with Down syndrome for eight months and during that time there was no information because the, it was the era when there was no internet so there was a lot of myth and misconception and also belonging to our parents belong to the generation where they do not want to tell you what's going on with your sibling. So you find out, I found out five years later what actually happened to my sister. So the information gap that exists in the society today is what makes me want to create awareness on Down syndrome. Now, I think uh, Eric has said almost everything there is to say, but I just highlight some things that I was noting as he was speaking. Uh, one thing is Down syndrome is the most common chromosomal error, yeah? Uh, uh, is the most uh, common condition caused by chromosomal errors. And chromosomal errors is just like, 
see you and me. Um, my skin color is the way it is because my chromosomes are 46. My hair is the way it is because my chromosomes are 46. I'm speaking the way I'm speaking because um, someone said they can't hear. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> So my skin color is the way it is because I have 46 chromosomes. Uh, I walk the way I walk because I reason the way I reason because I have 46 chromosomes, which is what if all, all of us have. But the moment you have an extra chromosome or genetic information, uh, now that is where now Down syndrome is likely to occur because it's like you've thrown the body into confusion. Now the body knows it's supposed to have for during conception, the body is supposed to have 46 chromosomes. Now there's the 47th one. Where is all that information supposed to go? So that is where you come. Uh, you have now uh, Down syndrome amongst other chromosomal uh, conditions. And then uh, when Down syndrome occurs on its own, like the, the individual has no other underlying issues like Eric had mentioned hypothyroidism, congenital heart disease, and all those conditions, that individual is going to function like me and you. Only that, they will take time. Like now, you can hear what I have said, and you're able to process it. Some of the Down syndrome may take another hour or two to exactly process what has been said. If they do not have any other underlying issues, then they're going to function. It's just that they will take a little more time to get there. And uh, what actually uh, gets in the way of individuals who are living with Down syndrome is the opportunistic diseases that they suffer from. Remember, Erica said that uh, Down syndrome has all these other uh, diseases that it attracts. And it also impairs the immune system. So the immune system is almost always compromised. If they're not suffering from uh, congenital heart disease, they have gut issues, they have pneumonia. So those are the conditions, those are the opportunistic diseases that really uh, shorten the lifespan of people who are living with Down syndrome or uh, hamper us with the way they go about their day-to-day -day, uh, issues. Now, I just wanted to highlight a few things where if you are a parent or a caregiver of, in this case now, you guys are caregivers, just a few things uh, you can take notes. There, there is no way, there is no clear cut way to manage Down syndrome because now Eric had also mentioned that it happens, the severity is different. There's someone who is mildly down, having Down syndrome and there's another one who has severe Down syndrome. And the other thing that you need to know is there's a type of Down syndrome which you will not notice that person has Down syndrome at all because there are three types of Down syndrome. It's balanced, you won't know, but they will still exhibit uh, the delayed milestones of individuals who have Down syndrome. So you see, because of the severity, there is no clear cut way uh, to manage Down syndrome. However, uh, the first step, which it's what all of you have taken, is learning about Down syndrome. Do not stop learning. This is a good initiative that you guys have shown the interest uh, to learn about Down syndrome. And that is where it all begins, right? And then the information that now you are getting is what is going to help you um, to facilitate or to help these individuals to grow. And you notice that. The way you're saying, I had someone saying that uh, these individuals may appear rude or something. Uh, what individuals with Down syndrome ha uh, have is they don't, they are not born with an innate, uh, or you see, as we are social beings, all of us, even they are social beings, but their social skills are not like ours. So they need to learn or someone needs to teach them how to be social or how to behave in a setting where there are other individuals. And that is where now the aspect of early intervention that had been mentioned comes in. And it comes in with in terms of behavioral therapy, 
occupational therapy, speech therapy, physiotherapy, all these things combined, they are going to help uh, to shape how the person who is living with disability is going to maneuver their day-to-day -day, uh, life as they are interacting with the rest of us. And then um, now that you're also having children who have uh, Down syndrome, it's important to set a routine. Like when they wake up in the morning, they need to make their bed first, then they brush their teeth, then after that they have breakfast, then after that they take a shower or, you know, like a routine of, from when they wake up up to the time they, they need to take a break, what they need to be doing, right? Because now they also do well when they need to repeat, they need to, there's repetition, they are going to do well. So you, you, you introduce a routine to them and you stick by that routine so that in, when they, they wake up in the morning, they know they are supposed to make their bed, they are supposed to uh, brush their teeth, they are supposed to, every, each of them will now know what they are supposed to do after every chore. You can also now have uh, visual representations of certain items, like if they need to brush their teeth, the, uh, the area that they brush their teeth from, you can put a sticker around the sink that shows brushing your teeth. If it's somewhere that it's maybe fetching water or something, you can indicate, just have visual representations of the chores that they need to have. So because then they are very visual. So when they see that visual representation, they know ah, it's time to eat, it's time to brush my teeth, it's time to, because then they also have a short memory, some of them, which now, they'll forget, a lot of things they'll forget. Sometimes you can have, uh, you can give an individual with Down syndrome three choices, A, B, C, but by the time you're getting to C, they have already forgotten A and B, so they'll pick C. So that is why you need to have visual representation to aid them in remembering uh, a lot of things. So I think that's all I had for now, because most of what Eric has said, um, is what there is to, uh, about Down syndrome, unless someone has a question. Uh, that's all I had. Oh, and I also wanted to note that genetic anomalies cannot be corrected. So once these individuals are born and diagnosed with Down syndrome, that cannot uh, be corrected. So it's up to us to help them and to support them in ensuring to ensure that uh, they live a quality life to the, to the best of our ability. So Eric, that's all I have now. Thank you, Teresa. So we'll leave it open um, for further discussion. You can, any of us can answer any of the questions. You can ask a question and direct it to any of us. We will be glad to, to pick it up. But just as she said, I'll also comment on, um, on the learning bit of it. I will emphasize, especially if you are taking on children with disabilities, it's important to be able to learn those various disabilities and know how to react to them. For instance, as we say, a person with living with Down syndrome is a very joyous person, very happy, and they're very routine. They know that at this particular time, I'll do this, and then I'll do this, then I'll do this, and then I'll do this. Whenever you are having more than one, two, or three people within a community, it is important to allocate the people living with Down syndrome specific chores to be able to handle. And you can be sure that they will handle them so well within the time that you've set for them if they have developed that routine. And that is why you see, um, if, if it's brushing that teeth, as she said, he knows he will need to brush his teeth. He does it in this way, and this is his toothbrush. They may not take anything else uh, and, do, and do probably use something else. So they will insist on what they have learned. I know that uh, when you tell them to go to a certain place, he knows this is the route to the place. If you tell him a different route, it becomes a big issue to convince him to go that way. Now, problems come in when you want to force him to go that way. You only need to help him understand that this route is also goes to the place we want to go. So that you, if, if you knew that, it would be very easy to handle uh, those people within your homes, within the school environment, or within the institutions you're, you, you, you're running and where you're working, and they will be very helpful to you. Um, the, the thing to do is to make sure that they are not excluded from the daily chores of a home. 
do not underrate them. They are able to deliver. They will be able to do it. We have some of them who are employed. Some of them in other places have gotten married. So it is possible to make these people work and live a full life. Let's take more questions. Um, thank you for sharing with us. Just to ask, is there any way, maybe food, you can give to these people, they can eat anything? You may realize that some of them, maybe even at an age of 10, they are not able to swallow food. To take hard food, you have to put some, to make it a bit watery. So are there some type of foods they can eat? I'll ask Teresa to take that, if you can. Um, yeah, OK, yeah, sure. First, uh, you can't uh, have a clear cut uh, nutritional uh, way of feeding them because remember the severity is different. And, and some of these people have gastrointestinal uh, issues. So I'd say that uh, if this individual does not have an issue that is affecting their digestive system or their GI, then I, um, I don't think there is a specific diet, but I stand correction, Eric, you can correct me. But if they have an underlying issue that is affecting their digestive system, then now you need to, to determine the, the food that you, you will um, give to them. But of course, for you to determine this, then you need to have gone to a developmental pediatrician or a doctor who is going to help you uh, know the food that you're going to give them or if they have any issues with their gut. Yeah, back to you, Eric, in case there is anything you need to add. Yes, um, what Teresa says is correct. The only thing that you need to determine about a person living with Down syndrome is um, what is their mental health state? But otherwise they will eat any, anything you, anybody else will eat in the family. What we only tell uh, and which we are insisting, just like any other child, is we avoid very sweet things because they are very vulnerable to um, throat infections, you know, and those kind of things. So avoid those things that are not genuine. Try and give them real food um, and avoid a lot of this other stuff that um, I, I accelerates their vulnerability to any other opportunity diseases. But basically, Down syndrome have no particular um, dietary requirements, except where the doctor has advised. Thank you. Very good. Any other question? Excuse me. Yes, please. Uh, my question is, what causes this Down syndrome, especially during conception? Okay, just as you said, it's, it's an accident. When the male sperm meets the female egg, there is always the fusion, and therefore there is the cell division to begin to create a fetus. And during that process, there's an accident. You know, we can't explain. There's no medical uh, research that has sufficiently said what causes that accident, but something happens, and then you have on the, on, on the 21st chromosome, you have an extra member. So you have 47 instead of 46 in any person. So it's a pure accident. It's not witchcraft, as some people will always keep telling you. It is not seen against God, as some people would also say. It is not that uh, it is carried forward from your family to my family, I mean, on, on downwards. So it's, it's none of those. It's, it's a pure accident that happens and, and, and nothing has been found. Now, when I mention this, I also want to say that um, when a person has conceived and you'd want to confirm if your child or your fetus is correct, you can still find out. There are tests that can be done when a, a lady is pregnant to determine whether the child developed Down syndrome or not. That is, um, it, it's, it's, uh, I, I think in Kenya it should be now available um, that you can test whether that is. However, the moral bit of it is, so if you have discovered that you're carrying a baby that has Down syndrome, what do you do? That is a moral bit. So I wouldn't want to go and find out whether my child is Down syndrome or not. Because then once I've done that, what do I, do I want to flush out the baby or do I want to carry the pregnancy to the town? So those are things that uh, we begin to look at. And 
it's important that uh, before you even go for those that test, you want to find out. However, parents who have had one child with Down syndrome may be fearful and so would want to go in and find out whether the next pregnancy has that problem also. But as I said, it's purely accidental. It doesn't come to the next person. As Teresa said, sometimes uh, we have parents who have uh, children. One comes as autistic, another one comes as Down syndrome. Again, we are not able to explain. Those are things that happen accidentally. Um, so you'll find a parent with more than one form of disability in their house. Okay, thank you. Karibu sana. Yes, I have a question. Yes, please. Yeah, you have said that uh, these people with the Down syndrome, others get employed and even others get married. Yes. Now, my question is, for example, this lady, probably she got married. Is there any possibility that uh, when she gives birth, she can have a Down syndrome child? Um, the fear we have is it will carry forward, but again, as you said, it is not, it's, it's not, it's not uh, in the family line. It doesn't mean that when I get my son, you'll also get, or my daughter will also get a child with Down syndrome. It, it, it doesn't, it's not automatic that way. It's an accident. If it happens, it does, but it doesn't mean it will carry on. It is. It doesn't go down the lineage, so you don't need to worry about that one. Uh, can I add Thank something, you. Eric? Yes. Um, I'd like to say that uh, we have three types of Down syndrome, which the most common is trisomy twenty-one, and and almost everybody has it. Like ninety percent of people have it, so the, there is no likelihood of the um, that being passed. However, we have one very rare though type of Down syndrome that can be passed to a child from the mother or the father to the child. However, it's nothing to worry about because it's rare, but it is important to know that that type of Down syndrome exists and can be inherited. It, it's a translocation type of Down syndrome. Okay, thank you, Teresa. There is trisomy 21, there is translocation, and there is mosaic. Those are three different, but if you, if you go into the technicalities of it, it's a bit complex to get to know those three different types. But the one we've described more, the one that you have on an extra chromosome number 21, that one is, is easier to explain, is, is the one you're talking about trisomy 21. The translocational is where one moves from a totally different point to trisomy to, to a chromosome number 21, so that's, that, that there are small variations in their differences, but they're still all the Down syndrome. So, so it's a bit complex when you come to begin to explain about the, the different types of Down syndrome. Good, um, probably we'll take another one. That's me. Kenya, yes. When you mention you mentioned three, I, I'm hearing 46 and 47 chromosome, and then this 21 is confusing me. Can you elaborate more about 21 chromosomes? Um, Teresa, you want to talk about that? Uh, that's okay. So, um, yes. when during conception, like when the sperm cell is fertilizing the ovum. Now, the mother will provide, each parent contributes a number of chromosomes and the father contributes a number of chromosomes. So chromosomes is basically like what me, like the carrier of genetic information. So sir, the first chromosome, um, the mother will contribute 23 chromosomes, the father will contribute 23 chromosomes. So the number one chromosome from the dad and number one chromosome from the mom form a pair number two, number three, number four, number five. So ideally you have 23 pairs, but they are 46 because when you count them in one, 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 they are 46, okay? So the pair that is parallel number 21, that is the pair that is responsible for causing Down syndrome. So when Kamahaita separates, the errors that occur in that um, chromosome those in a letter Down syndrome. Uh, 
umeelewa ama nimeku confuse zaidi yes i'm now getting maybe matete help and add more <laughs> <laughs> yeah so as she says the man contributes 23 chromosomes the female contributes 23 that adds to 20 46 that is 23 pairs times 2 that is 46 however each of those chromosomes is numbered so you get from number 1 2 3 4 5 up to 23 but at chromosome number 21, there is a division that is abnormal, creating an extra. So instead of two, instead of a pair, you have three. So you have the usual 46 plus that one extra on chromosome number 21. That's why it's specific because every chromosome has different genetic information for the body. Uh, uh, is, is that a little clearer? Thank you, thank <laughs> so you. Yeah, so that is what causes Down syndrome. Anna, my name. Anna? Yes, please. So, so far you have mentioned of the, you have mentioned it, that yes. there are three types of syndrome. Mm -hmm. We have this Down syndrome. Yes. And from maybe the small, the little knowledge of high school. We have the mm -hmm. other one. Klein-Felter syndrome and Tunner syndrome. Is this 21 chromosomes at the range of the Klein-Felter syndrome or what is it? I'm still hanging somewhere there. Because from the knowledge of or maybe high school, the Klein-Felter is the one which is having the, the extra chromosome. Maybe a man having XX, XX, I'm not, I'm still hanging somewhere on that 21 chromosome or the extra 47. Okay, I, I, I may not remember about the ones you're mentioning about, but what I know is about Down syndrome is that all of us are made up of this, that each one of us has got, our cells have got this genetic, this information bearing uh, member that now translates into what we are. And the chromosomes come in pairs. So each one of us has 46. 46, um, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Therefore we have 46 genetic uh, members that form in that. So on the 21st chromosome is what we have an extra member that forms, the, so 46 plus one that forms 47. So that is where the problem begins and makes somebody a bit different from the others. It causes those intellectual and mental and um, developmental uh, disorders and facial, certain facial features that become very evident when it comes to that. Now, within the Down syndrome itself is where we say, we've got three, three different types of Down syndrome, which do not vary very much, but the basic thing is it is caused by more or less the same thing, an extra chromosome. It's just that it, it how it happens varies a little. It just varies a little. And that somebody's asking, how does it happen? It's just accidental. We might, we're not able to explain how. You have an extra member on the 21st chromosome. Instead of the two, you have three. It's one of those things that science has not revealed. Until, unless they have come up with something new now, we don't as yet have that information. Um, let me just point out something, Eric, before we proceed. To the lady who yeah. has asked the question, uh, I'd just like to note that Klein-Felter syndrome is not part of uh, Down syndrome, and then the and then the X chromosome has no um, input in causing Down syndrome. Yeah, I think that's an that's a whole different uh, condition on its own. You mentioned of the three types of the Down syndrome. Please, may you come again? Yeah, the three types. Rather, of maybe you put them on the chat. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Teresa will put them on the chat. As she does that, is there any other? Richard, I know you're also getting many questions. Probably you'd also forward them. Huh? Will forward as soon as it comes. Okay. 
um, excuse me ma'am. yes there's also you put them on the chat it's yes. also good i think you can talk about them about the translocational so that we can know the difference between the translocation and the, the chromosome 21 and then what you talked of is it mosaic yes. even if it is not those deeper details but at yes. least to have a flesh of each of them no please okay. okay thank you for that so teresa will work on that Also, I, um, I'm asking if you would put on the chat about adenoids, adenoids, hyperthyroidism. Okay. Just give us a slice of what it all contains about. Okay. So we will form that, that question basically deals with with with, um, with uh, medical issues about the person with Down syndrome. So we'll send that about uh, hypothyroidism. We've got the heart issue, we've got the ear issues. So we'll send that information as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other concerns as we go along? Can I ask? Yes, please. Is it possible to prevent the Down syndrome during the pregnancy? There's no known method of preventing Down syndrome. As we say, it's an accident. You only discover much later. Unless you do the tests during pregnancy, you may not know until after birth. And, and, and interest, interestingly, many people don't also realize it until much later. Um, so there's no way of determining one that you have a Down syndrome pregnant, uh, pregnancy until you give birth. Uh, number two, there's no treatment for Down syndrome. There's only intervention methods and therapies that help, but we don't have treatment. So there's nobody. <laughs> we saw, we saw, we've had people who have been called into giving money for treatment for Down syndrome. So far, we have none that we know of that can treat Down syndrome. Not Kenyaji, not uh, modern medical uh, methods. We don't have any. So let no parent be convinced to go for treatment, either to our ganga arm or to the, what do you call, the, the, the other medical fields that uh, convince people that they'll be treated. You can only deal with the, with the, with the, with the effects of the extra chromosome by therapy and correctional surgeries and therapies. Hello. Yes, please. Maybe something to ask on uh, what about the age factor? Because there's somewhere we talked about the older you get, uh, there's a lot of attempt to get children with Down syndrome. Is it only on women's side or also male? Because you realize, I realized that some men, even at 70, they, they attempt to pregnant even children. I don't know what about it. Thank you. OK. There's somebody who has asked a question. What is Down syndrome in Kiswahili? It is Udumavu. 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 Um, the issue on age, again, there is always the fear that the older you get, the more the, more the chances of you getting a child with disability or an imperfect child. Same fears exist in, uh, in Down syndrome, that the older you get, the likelihood of getting a child with Down syndrome. Um, we do not have any scientific evidence for the fact that older people are the ones who are likely to get, because we have a whole range of them. Of course, there's still that argument that the older you get, that's the general argument in um, in the medical field, the older you get, the likelihood of getting a child with, the, with, with, with the, an abnormality of some sort. So for us, the fear is not that. It's just, again, as I say, it's just accidental. 
they may not be cons it may not be connected to age per se. So the fear needs to be taken out of people. So that uh, if you get 45 and you haven't gotten a child, you think that you like to get it. No, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not that obvious. It's not been proven scientifically that Down syndrome is related, it's directly related to the age of the parents. Thank you. Very good. Any other concern? Excuse me, Mr. Eric. Yes, please. Uh, first, I want to thank you for giving us your experience about yourself, about yes. your, your son. And as we were talking about him being a Down syndrome, and later he developed a pro another problem, mm. I just remembered I had uh, people like that one. What might mm. be the causes? And is it, is it likely to be to cause, to get into many children who are Down syndromes or it just comes accidentally for those who will be a so, dead or- Sorry, what, what, sorry just repeat that question. Uh, you're saying what gets in? Into conversing. Is it to all or to some? It is not to all, it is to some. It's not everybody that will get affected. And if, if, if it does happen, but quite, Quite a bit is also affecting people with Down syndrome. So you need to research and find out what the issue is. I'll give you, for example, we're still trying to find out what the cause for our son's convulsions is because he's, he's not fever, he's not temperature. So we've had to do quite a bit. Uh, we, of course, discovered that his heart rate was very low. It's at 45 instead of the usual about 78. So that could be a possible cause. We're working on that. He was hypothyroidic. That means his thyroid was functioned way below. So we have put him on medical treatment for try and make sure that that begins to function. And it's still an ongoing process. So it's not everybody that will get, but it's a very likelihood that as they grow, they will also develop conversions. So it is important to check. It is important to maintain medical checkups, if possible on an annual basis for a person with Down syndrome. You need to check the heart, the ears, the eyes, the thyroid function, very crucial, and the heart function. They're very crucial to keep on checking on a periodic basis. If their thyroid function isn't well, you may need to come down to doing it every three months, but an annual check on the thyroid function, if it is okay, should, should suffice. It is important that those things are checked to make sure that the child grows well. Now, part of the problem that you realize, a lot of people with Down syndrome, you'll discover they're not growing as they ought to because their heart is not functioning very well. So you need to have that heart check, especially when they are growing up and they're not gaining weight, it becomes a problem. Then as they grow older, because of feeding, if you don't regulate their feeding, they also gain too much weight and too much weight puts them down. One is a lot of them develop flat foot, flat feet. And flat feet with weight becomes a problem later in future. So try to avoid too much gaining of weight because it affects their, 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 their feet. It, it brings a lot of pain on their feet so they cannot move as they ought to. Try and exercise, let them try and exercise. Let them play as much as they can play. Let them play as much as they can play. Let them be active because when they eat and sit down, they gain weight and getting down that weight can be a problem. And that weight will impact on their heart, will impact on their walking. It is important to check on those particular things. So even in the homes that you have those children, as I said, you need to know the speciality for each child. Then you begin to intervene on their behalf as individuals. It is not a generalized autistic, it will not be the same thing, same way you'll treat a Down syndrome. It's not the same way you'll take a cerebral palsy a child. They're different. And each of them will need special attention in their areas. Um, how, uh, is there any other question? Okay, my, my concern is about the, for example, okay, homes are different, but I mean, biological homes for maybe these people or the children, but for yeah. example, the, the children who are vulnerable, maybe they, they are in the institutions, 
So I'm just, it's not a question, but it's the way I'm feeling that if uh, a home is to be established and for this type of uh, uh, condition, I think also the, um, the weather, I mean, the climate of the area should be considered because of, I heard of like pneumonia, they can optimistic infection, for example, because of also breathing system. I have, I have an experience of where many of them are being uh, hospitalized because they can't breathe well. Yeah, so if can a warmer place maybe be suitable for this type of uh, people than in, a, in very cold areas because already the cold is a, a, an issue. Um, you know, we, we all come from different places and we adapt based on where we are born. A child in Limuru uh, will still grow as well as a child in uh, Mombasa, so long as there's proper care of that child. Keep the child warm, avoid things that would easily subject them to, to infections. If you're try, trying to create a, a, children, a children's home, probably you may think of a warmer place, but for me, um, the environment within the home is what is more important. Are they kept warm? Just like any other child, are they kept warm? Are they fed well? Are they allowed to exercise properly? For me, general area doesn't matter. The important thing is what is the environment like at home? Now, I'll also mention something about what we believe about schooling for children with Down syndrome, which is very crucially, uh, we, we still insist in that pocket that children of Down, with Down syndrome need to grow up in a home environment. A lot of them are sent to to boarding schools um, or homes to keep them away from the home environment, we still advocate that home is the best place for a person with Down syndrome to go. Because then they learn, they have the love, they have the ability to share in a society, in a community, in a home, and show themselves as a member of a society. So we still, we still would want them to grow. So wherever the place is, create an environment that is good enough for them. It is not about where exactly, but it's just what is the environment the children live in, just like any other child who want to live. Does that uh, help? Yes, thank you. You're most welcome. Next concern. Thank you for sharing with us. <clears throat> but I'm feeling uh, because we have these children in our institutions, yes. uh, many parents that do not accept this situation because maybe they don't have the knowledge, as you said, we have to educate them, but how maybe we are not able to reach them. And then they bring these children there because at home they are rejected by the society and the children in the public schools. So it is also a ch challenge for us as we deal with them because we find many of them are put in our institutions. And not only that, we have other different disabilities. So to follow them, it also become hard for us. And even to know the caregivers may not know all this situation the children are undergoing because they may be out autis, autis, autistic, Down syndrome, and even the spinal bivida. All of them may be like in our, in our institution, they are all of them there because they're of the occupational therapy and the facial therapy. So as you speak, um, I'm thinking about them because we are not able to give them what they need, maybe to follow them one by one because they are many. So it will become a problem and a challenge for us. And sometimes it's not easy and we don't know how to go about it because the homes are few. And there are so many children struggling there in the world, in the, in the country, I can say. Mm. Uh, that's a concern for me. We, we, we as a society really do appreciate the kind of work you're doing. It is not easy. I, I tell you because we have one, one boy, and I'm imagining if we had five boys in, or children in the home with disability, how would we handle them? It is a challenge, and we really do respect you for what you're able to handle. Um, as you continually handle these children and work with them, reach out as you've just done to the societies that exist, for instance, Down syndrome society, the autistic society of Kenya, you know, where they can come and help with it, they will come and help. We, we are willing to come and give talks, we're willing to come and 
and, and help where we can. We may not have the money to be able to put into those projects, but we will be able to come and, and, and assist where it needs. We can give you professionals who can assist. We'll recommend with doctors who would want to come and give a talk and if it's educationists, because that is how we have learned to survive. But because it's not an easy path and we really respect to what you're doing. But again, as we say, these disorders may be so many that you may not really remember to grasp a piece of each, I, I mean, everything about each of them. But the little that you know about each of those disorders will help you a long way in going towards helping those children. For instance, and I keep on saying, if you have five Down syndrome, uh, for living Down syndrome in your, in your institution and they're well cultured, you know they can be employed as workers in your place in terms of they will help you achieve what you want to help rather than be too much dependent on you. Because as, I, as we say, once intervention is done, a person living with disability or disorder Down syndrome will be able to work as well, you know, set up the table, clean up the place. How do we uh, use them to be able to help us and the society at large and the community they live in? Um, you'll find it interesting. We, we discovered when we were going out, you know, usual awareness campaigns all over the country, that you'll find people with living disability who have grown up in the rural areas and have been have been inculcated, have been accepted into society, are doing a lot better than those who have grown up in the in, in, in the urban areas. Because in the urban areas, a lot of people pamper the children and give them extra care. In the rural areas, when people are going out to graze cattle, this guy will also go. So he has to learn to take care of those cattle. If he's going to cut grass, he will also go along. If they're going to the shamba, so they grow up with the skills to keep themselves. And you find those in the rural areas will be able to, to be a lot more independent in that, in that manner than those grown up in the urban areas who seem to have received a lot of care. And um, because of probably a bit of money, they, everything is done for them. So it is just an issue of how do we look at, how do we look at this disability? How can we maximize on this person's ability to do what he can do? It will help you as a society, as an institution, it will build you up. You have less labor force, you can even choose to pay them, employ them and pay them or do something, you know, help you in the society. We are working as a society on one of the biggest challenges that we have at the moment about acceptance in the job market. A person who living with Down syndrome will go to school, learn, but may not go intellectually so high. So it reaches a point where you take them from the mainstream academic uh, system and put them into a vocational training or a technical college to learn a trade or a skill. At a certain age, they need to come out because they'll not be there forever. Once they have learned that skill, they need to come out. So what happens with them after that? They would not need to sit home to depend on you. You now need to place them somewhere. We are working as a society to try and get possible employers to come in and check these people to help because they need to earn. In, as I said, in more developed economies, you'll find that they are actually employed and they work and they earn to sustain themselves. And that is what you're looking at in, 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 in this country also. We have approached a number of employers to see if they can take them on. Now, depending on what kind of work one can do, it's possible especially the kind of repetitive works that people do, packaging, um, uh, rearranging things in the shelves in the supermarket, they can do that very well, you know, that kind of thing. Depending on the severity, it's very possible. So if we look at the Down syndrome, person living Down syndrome in your institution, what can we do to help them to achieve more than just sitting here as a member of this institution? Uh, but I hope that is a lot clearer. Yes, thank you so much. Very good. More concerns? Any more concerns so that we can answer them? Yes, Eric. Yes. 
thank you very much for engaging us to that extent. Our biology has been awakened from high school to, <laughs> to primary school. Now, yeah. uh, you did mention that the society would be open uh, to help in capacity support in terms of uh, knowledge-wise. Yes. Uh, from your experience of working with the parents, because I had one of the sisters indicating that uh, reaching the parents is an issue, especially from the perspective of saying parents feel stigmatized, at least they help us, they don't kill the children, at least they send the children to the sisters' places where they would presume that the children would be uh, taken care of. What is the framework like of trying to look out for these parents, capacitate them, because there's this general trend of deinstitutionalizing children. It is a good approach. Uh, many children's homes are being encouraged to return children to their parents or relatives, etc. It would seem that uh, DSSK might figure out how to work with the sisters in their institutions uh, to sort of journey with the parents associated, uh, associated to these institutions. Uh, and it is a really massive project because look at destigmatizing the condition, making sure the, the parents can receive the children back, preparing them to receive them and all that entire arrangement. I don't know if BSSK is open to that kind of arrangement and if they have been uh, considering taking steps in that direction. Thank, thank you, Richard. One, one of the things I would want to say is that um, parents who have children with Down syndrome, um, one of the things they need to do is to first accept that these are just children and that they're not different from the others, except, except that they will need a little more than the others. And once that is done, then they will be easy, it will be easy for them to learn to live with those children. But the, first, the normal first instant is to have a rejection by the parent of this child and they find that they feel it is a burden. Now, there is a genuine aspect that they are a burden to them because now they are, the cost for bringing up this child is a lot more than the other children, because especially on the medical bit of it. However, if you looked at it, that this is a child like any other, you begin to bring them up, intervene when they need to be, to have that intervention done, you will accept them. Now, the society, one of the things the society does is to look out for those kind of parents, bring them in on board and tell them, look here, so-and-so has a child with Down syndrome. This one has, this is my experience. This is her experience. This is their experience. And that is one of the first aspects in about, about uh, making parents accept to live with their children, that yes, it is possible. There are people who have them, they have these children and they have brought them up successfully. You will only need to rearrange your programs. You need to rearrange your programs. And if you consider that this is part and parcel of your life, you didn't have another life that you're thinking is being interfered with other than comparing yourself with somebody else, then that is the first step to know that this is my life. This is my child's life. I need to live with him, live with her. And you work out something workable. As institutions, we are willing to come to, to talk to those who you have gathered to help us. Or if you want us to do person to person, we also do that. Just a couple of months ago, uh, a person called and said, look here, we have a 17 year old, the parents died suddenly. In a span of one month, both parents had died. Now this child is being given to a relative to take care of. He has no knowledge. Now he's coming in as part of his family. And the first thing he did is to reach out to us and he said, fine, we need to meet that person, assess and then tell you what we think, where he is, this is the way to go. And, and that's the kind of thing we'll tell you. Where we, where we see this child is, this is his capabilities, go this way. Um, it is not a, it's a, not a cut and paste thing. It is when we assess the situation, we'll advise you how to go, to go about it. So we are willing to come. We, as we said, we do awareness campaigns. We, when we, when we have available funds, we've, we've done Mombasa, we've done Eldoret, we've done Kisumu, we've done Nakuru um, and Nairobi, several uh, seminars. And we want to establish those particular units within those regions. So that it's not that we must carry out anything from Nairobi if 
uh, parents are in Eldoret, they have a group that they can always form and help each other on matters that pertain to the growth of the children. The best thing about this is sharing experiences unlocks a lot of things. So when you, when you get parents who seem difficult, they only need to be talked to in many cases. You want to talk to them as a group, or you want to talk to them as individuals who would be willing to help in that aspect of, of, uh, of accepting the children. So that even if they go back to the society, they come in their homes, they are accepted in their homes. They are part and parcel of their home. Um, of course, a lot of times we condemn parents sometimes. For instance, where you have a single mother, she's the breadwinner of the family, she has four children, but she's the only worker in the home. She has to go to work. So what does she do? She locks up the child in the room, in the house or in a room. Or worst case scenario, change the child to post till he, she comes back, but she can't go with that child because her employer or the place she's going to work will not accept that child. How do you deal with those challenges? Again, sometimes we condemn parents. We haven't listened to their side of the story. As I said, one of the first patients to deal with when you're dealing with disability is the guardian or the parent. How have you understood their position? Where are they at? Before you begin to judge them on the way they are bringing up their children or the way they are acting. We are willing, we will, if, if, if we need to, we'll refer them to the specialists that we have worked with to be able to come and talk to you, to you and give the necessary help. Thank you. Richard Aida, I'm um, over to you again. Hello. Teresa, you want to comment on that as well? Yeah, no, uh, not comment, but uh, just a clarification. Uh, in those towns that you, or regions you mentioned, okay. you have offices. Anybody else would want to ask something? Hello? Hello. Oh, we seem to be losing you. Hello. Yeah. Okay. That's better now. Okay. I was uh, trying I to can say. Hear you. Can you hear? Yes, I hear you. Hello. Hello. Yes, you can go ahead. Okay. I, I was only saying go that ahead. on those regions where you mentioned, do you have offices yes. around the regions? We, we haven't established offices in those places. We only have contacts in some of those regions. So we will, we will link you up with the parents who are in that particular area. Um, some of them, we still have to establish contacts in those places because you've got a lot of people in those places. As we said, Down syndrome is one of the, big, the, the highest number of uh, developmental disorder population. In every 800 to 1,000 births, there's one child that is born with Down syndrome. Therefore, we estimate in this country should have one in about, we should have about 50 to 60,000 people living with Down syndrome. And therefore, uh, it's a big population distributed all over this country. We should be able to have contacts in every of those sections. We are still trying to, to get some of those other sections so that there is local support from where within your, your local area. So if you've come from Kisi, we'll tell you we've got this person in Kisi, you can get to see what they are doing in Kisi. If not, we'll also help you from this point to be able to establish more contact and help. Thank you. Sorry, Busana. Any other? Is it possible? Is it possible to get your contacts? Yes, it is. We will uh, yeah. send them. Um, you have a pen with you, or we do we send them to you? You can write we, also we will on send the them chat. to you on, on, on the chat. Yes, thank you. Oh, we seem to lose you. Hello? Hello. Yes. Hello? Are we there? We can hear. Yeah, we can hear you. Hello? 
Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, anybody else with a concern? Somebody was trying to ask, but I think uh, he got lost. So let's, if there's anybody else. I think she was asking about the contacts. Okay, the contacts, we're putting it on the chat. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, is Richard there? Richard is right here. I disconnect myself because I'm using two devices. I don't want an echo. Okay, okay. Okay, unless there are any other questions, if there's none, then I think I'll, I'll ask Teresa if you have any last words. Then we'll we'll send it back. We'll send give it back to Richard. We can't hear you. We can't hear Teresa. Eric Rosalind is on the call. I don't know if she wants to share anything after Teresa. Okay, let's have Teresa, then you can have, uh, yeah. Um, I was looking at my notes and the final thing that I'd love to share is with regards to communication. And uh, because we say these individuals have short memory, as a caregiver or if these children are in your care, remember to ask one question at a time do not also listen as well is loaded like a, a question that needs needs them to needs a paragraph for an answer no just ask short questions and then they answer then you ask another they answer so if you want to ask them what is their name where they are going and who they are with do not ask that as one question just ask them what's your name when they are through uh after the answer uh, where they are going something like that remember to just ask one question at a time and in short places yeah that's all for me thank you very much Teresa. um you were asking about our contacts so i'll also let me introduce our programs coordinator uh roslyn roslyn Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is, my name is, good morning. Morning, my name is, my name is, good morning, Rosalind Buru. My name is Rosalind Buru. I'm the coordinator for Down Syndrome Society of Kenya. Sorry, I joined you guys a bit late but I had this uh, plant already. So um, I'm going to share our contacts on the chat. So if at all you have any question or maybe you'd like us to assist in, in anything kindly, you can reach me through the contact that I'm going to share or maybe through the email address. So thank you so much. And thank you, Richard, for organizing for this. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh... I think as a society, we are honored to have had this opportunity to share this information. Um, it's a good platform for us to let you know of our existence and our presence. We do organize several functions through the year, but most, most of which are geared towards helping parents to uh, come together and share experiences, number one. Number two, we also want to bring families together to share fun with. Then number three, we do have some fundraising activities in the course of the year to ensure that uh, the society keeps uh, running. As, as we said, government has not been helpful in terms of keeping the societies running. So we are using and basing support from the parents and well-wishers to be able to run our offices and our activities. 
we therefore organize sometimes organize fundraisings and uh, talks or all over the country to have people come and also support us in carrying out this mandate. We are lobbying government to be able to accept to houses or at least run some of the activities of the society, but that still has a long uh, way to go. It doesn't seem to be coming now that the budget cuts are taking place even more, but we pray that we shall be able to get more opportunities to share to, to everybody about what, what we are doing. As you said, our intention is to make sure that a person born with Down syndrome lives their full potential of life, and that anybody who gives birth to a child with Down syndrome does not live in ignorance. Because ignorance makes those children not grow to their full potential and they become dependent instead of becoming independent. Your help in this, your participation in this has helped us reach out to one. We, I can see we have over 40 people on this chat and I know more people will receive this information from your contacts as you go along. There are several groups all over the country that are helping in terms of Down syndrome or disability. Um, but the information that is shared this way helps to make the people a lot better every single day. You are welcome. Whenever we, we would also have any function, we will alert you so that you also could come and be part and parcel of what we are doing. Uh, one of the best ways to learn is to come and see what is happening. Come and see the people as they participate, as they interact, then you'll get to know yes. And every time you see a person living with Down syndrome, you'll always know, I can help in this way and you can, I can talk to the parent in this manner. We are so grateful, we're so thankful, and uh, I think I pray for God's blessing upon you. Thank you, Richard, and may God keep you well. Asante. Uh, Richard, are you there? Um. Thank you very much, Eric, for offering us that wisdom. Teresa and Roslyn, you know, when I wrote to our colleagues, sisters, I asked them for a parent, I asked them for a health and medical practitioner, I asked them for an advocate. I really made life very difficult for them. But it turns out that in Eric, Teresa, and Rosalind, we have done everything we had to do. We are really grateful uh, for this opportunity. Now, sisters, as you can see earlier in the discussion, Eric made a submission that we need to take seriously. He says the first person to reach out is the parent, because the parent themselves are also stigmatized dealing with a situation that seems to be strange to them. It would seem that it might be of use, especially those of us on the call who are ministering to children with Down syndrome, that we ought to reach out to the society so that the society knows where these children in our hands are. Because if the society is an advocacy entity, then they need to know where their members are. Their membership could be parents and persons with Down syndrome. So if you have children with Down syndrome in your institutions, then these children had better be known by the society. In that way, it increases their knowledge of who it is or their constituency uh, that they are advocating for. I'm really hoping that the society will also keep in touch with these institutions that our sisters are running uh, so that we do uh, collective advocacy. Personally, my background is in advocacy. By teaching this course, I've been challenged to see another section of people to do advocacy for. I'm involved in writing human rights reports to the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in the UPR. But for some reason, I had not been paying attention to the uniqueness of people or uh, persons with developmental disorders. So for me, it is also a learning opportunity here uh, to increase the scope of the people we do advocacy for. 
So sisters, thank you very much for attending and uh, to the Down Syndrome Society of Kenya, uh, Eric, uh, Rosalind, and Teresa, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. If you have assembled some material for us and you'd like to meet us again, we are still on for a few weeks. Uh, we would be glad to, to create the opportunity uh, again. If the medical doctors and health practitioners whom we have missed out on choose to show up some other time, uh, we will be glad to receive them. So good people, thank you very much for today once again. Uh, we look forward to further uh, interaction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gotcha. Okay.